Topola's dressing room was what Monsieur Ola grandly called a dressing room for superior actors. It was as shabby as all the other dressing rooms, but it was a little larger and had the decided privilege of having a fireplace. The log basket was all but empty, and the fire near defeated by the cold. Topola was sitting looking at his painted face in the mirror. He was a stout man with doughy features. How did you know the shoemaker had a snuff box in his pocket, Jan? Jan shrugged. I could hear his thoughts loud and clear, he said. Tetu, who was carefully packing away the wooden piero, listened and smiled, knowing that Jan's abilities were still unpredictable. Sometimes, without being aware of it, he could read people's minds. Sometimes, he could even see into the future. There was a rap at the door. Topola jumped up in surprise, spilling his wine onto the calico cloth on the dressing table so that it turned dark red. A huge man stood imposingly in the doorway, his smart black tailored coat emphasizing his bulk. Yet it was his face, not his garments, which caught Jan's attention. It was covered in scars, like the map of a city you would never wish to visit. His left eye was the color of rancid milk, the pupil, dead and black, could be seen beneath its curdled surface. He was a terrifying apparition. The man handed Topolan a card. The magician took it, careful to wipe the sweat from his hands before he did so. As he read the name Count Kalyovsky, he felt a quiver of excitement. He knew that the Count was one of the wealthiest men in Paris. This is an honour indeed, said Topolan. I am steward to Count Kalyovsky. I am known as Milkai, said the man. He held out a leather purse before him as one might hold a bone out to a dog. My master wants you to entertain his friends tonight at the chateau of the Marquis de Vildeval. If Count Kalyovsky is pleased with your performance, he jangled the purse, this will be your reward. The carriage is waiting. We would ask for haste. Yan knew exactly what Topolan was going to say. I shall be delighted. I shall be with you just as fast as I can get myself and my assistants together. Haste, Milkar repeated sharply. I don't want our horses freezing to death out there. They are valuable. The door closed behind him with a thud so that the thin walls shook. As soon as they were alone, Topolan lifted Tetu off his feet and danced him round the room. This is what we have been dreaming of! With this invitation, the doors of grand society will be open to us! He looked at his reflection in the mirror, added a touch of rouge to his cheeks, and picked up his hat and the box that contained the pistol. Are we ready to amaze, astound, and bewilder? Wait, wait, pleaded Jan. He pulled Tetu aside and said quietly, When I went to clear up this evening, I heard a voice speaking Romany, saying, The devil's own is on your trail. Run like the wind. What are you whispering about? asked Topolan. Come on, we'll be late. Yan said desperately, Please, let's not go. I have a bad feeling. The boy may be right, said Tetu. Come on, the two of you said Topolan. This is our destiny calling. Greatness lies ahead of us. <laughs> I've waited a lifetime for this. Stop worrying. Tonight, we will be princes. Jan and Tetu knew that it was useless to say more. They carried the long box with the pyro in it down the steep stairs, Jan trying to chase away the image of a coffin from his mind. All Topolan was thinking was that maybe the king and queen would be there. The thought was like a fur coat against the cold, which wrapped itself around him as he walked out into the bitter night. Yan's and Tetu's anxieties, forgotten.